welcome everyone. If for those of you have, who have attended a webinar before, you may know me. I'm Jennifer Boyko. I'm the Manager of Scientific Operations with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. Um, thanks for joining us today for this webinar, which is entitled Prevalence and Perpetrators of Elder Abuse in Canada. Does Victim Sexual Orientation Matter? Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that June, uh, which is the month we're in, marks National Indigenous History Month and National Indigenous Peoples Day um, will be celebrated on June 29th. The CLSA National Coordinating Centre and McMaster University are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee Nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Simon Fraser University, which is where today's presenter is based, is situated um, on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, uh, Slewato, and Musqueam nations, on which Simon Fraser University and Vancouver is located. As attendees of the webinar today, I do encourage you to continue learning and following the webinar, learning following the webinar, and uh, to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to do our research and live and work wherever that may be for you. Uh, reviewing some housekeeping points now, uh, everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the webinar today. If you need to change or test your audio during the webinar, you can just click audio settings, which is on the bottom of the Zoom window. At the end of today's uh, webinar, there will be a question and answer session. If you have a question for the presenter during the webinar, you can post it in the Q&A box, which is located in the bottom toolbar. The questions will be addressed at the very end of the webinar, and your question will be visible to all of the attendees to see. If you have any technical trouble concerning the webinar, if you can please use the chat box to communicate with our webinar team. Um, and the chat box is usually located on the side of your screen. Finally, a feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar, and we do invite you to complete it after exiting the Zoom session. Uh, the, brief, um, the brief survey will provide us with important feedback that we can use to plan future webinars like this one today. Now we are moving on to the webinar, uh, which is um, first World Elder Abuse Awareness Day will be marked and is marked annually on June 15th, and that's coming up. Uh, this day aims to heighten awareness of abuse and neglect of older persons, uh, focuses attention on prevention strategies, and highlights the significance of elder abuse as a public health and human rights issue. So today's webinar, um, uh, along those lines is entitled Prevalence and Perpetrators of Elder Abuse in Canada, Does Victim Sexual Orientation Matter? And it will be presented by Dr. Gloria Gutman. Dr. Gutman is a research associate and professor emerita at Simon Fraser University or SFU. She developed the Gerontology Research Center there and um, Department of Gerontology at SFU and directed both from 1982 to 2005. She is Vice President of the International Longevity Centre Canada and President of the North America Chapter International Society of Gerontechnology. Technology. Her research interests and publications include seniors housing, long-term care, health promotion, Geron Technology, a term that I've never really heard before, so I've learned something today, prevention of elder abuse, advanced care planning, and disaster mitigation. She is past president of the Canadian Association of Gerontology, the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics, and the International Network for Prevention of Elder Abuse. So we have a very esteemed uh, um, webinar uh, host today. So I hope you enjoy Dr. Gutman's session. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm talking to you from Vancouver. And uh, it's really appropriate to be talking on this subject this week, given, uh, as Jennifer has said, that on June 15th will be World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. And, you know, I was an, a, a strong advocate for prevention, mitigation of uh, elder abuse 
long before I became a researcher in this area. Um, I do mixed methods, but at heart, I am a number cruncher, and I'm one of those people who kept asking questions. How many are we talking about, and are there differences between groups? Uh, within the LGBT community, for some time, people had been saying that they thought that the victimization rates might be higher than other people. Um, with CLSA, it presented an opportunity to try to get some answers to those questions. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the research team. Uh, Heather Stewart is with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging in the Western Region. Uh, and uh, Mojgan Karbash is uh, a physician who works with me, but who is uh, very adept at doing the statistical analyses. Neither of them could be with us today, uh, so I will be carrying the ball. Uh, next slide. For those of you who are not familiar with elder abuse, we need to, to uh, note that internationally, five types are recognized, physical, psychological, financial, sexual, and also neglect. In some jurisdictions like British Columbia, they also include self-neglect. But uh, these are the five that are the classic ones that are recognized internationally. We need to realize that uh, elder abuse and neglect occur in a variety of settings in the community, in people's private homes, and across a range of institutional kinds of settings that include assisted living, that include long-term care, that also include uh, people who are in hospitals. But of the five types, the two most common are psychological and financial, and often they go together that people are, are preyed upon uh, financially by uh, using terms and uh, treating them in a way that, that makes it sound like they're not capable of managing their own money. Or if you, you know, in the old days, it used to be, uh, if you love me, you'll let me. Uh, in the case of financial abuse, it's if you love me, you'll lend me uh, with the idea that it doesn't ever get paid back. Uh, we also need to recognize that some people will experience more than one type, and it can occur uh, concurrently that they experience several types. As we say, often psychological goes with financial, uh, or it can be sequential. And in some other work that we've done, it looks like about 15% of people will have uh, been uh, um, victimized in more than one way and or by more than one perpetrator. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the, the uh, LGBT community, and here you'll note uh, we, we use just LGB because we had very few trans people in the CLSA sample, but people in the LGBT plus community, uh, many of them have experienced trauma, isolation, stigma, discrimination uh, over their lifespan. They are less likely to be partnered than their heterosexual peers, and if they have children, to be su supported by the children that they have, which are characteristics that does make them potentially more vulnerable than other older adults. To the to uh, typical elder abuse, which are of the five types, as well as to some unique forms, such as a threat to out them. So you know, not all older people who belong to that community have told the rest of the world that uh, they are a part of it. And so uh, that is, is sometimes a sword that is held over the head of the person uh, that if you don't do what I want, I'm going to tell your boss, uh, or I'm going to tell your children. Or another example would be 
uh, to say to the older person, you know, I, I will uh, keep you from seeing your grandchildren or your uh, or interacting with them. So there are various ways. So the LGBT community may experience the traditional five types plus a few others that are unique to the community. Next slide. What we wanted to do in this particular study was to estimate the prevalence of three different types of elder abuse. Uh, we could not do all five because CLSA only looks at psychological, physical, and financial. They only ask questions dealing with those three, not with all five. And when it comes to the perpetrator uh, variables, um, CLSA only gives information on the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim, the sex of the perpetrator, and whether or not they live with the victim. So we don't have uh, as much detail about the perpetrators as I would like to have, but this is more detail than uh, we've had before in Canada and uh, a sample size that is uh, in the area of about 535, which is not huge, but it's larger than other people have had in the past. So that makes it very exciting to work with this data. Um, next slide. So the three research questions, first of all, are the prevalence rates for abuse types different amongst the gender and sexual orientation groups? Are they higher? Or are they lower uh, for people who are lesbian or who are gay or bisexual? Uh, we want to know, are the perpetrator profiles different depending on which type of abuse we're looking at? And the third question is, are the perpetrator profiles different uh, for people in the four uh, gender sexual orientation groups. Next slide. So we analyzed uh, data from CLSA participants who were 65 and over at follow-up one. So the elder abuse module only came on at follow-up one, and it was only administered to people who were 65 and over. Uh, for most of you will be well aware of CLSA, which I consider to be a national treasure. Uh, it does start at age 45 or people who were age 45 at baseline and will continue with follow-ups. Uh, but the uh, elder abuse module was administered in follow-up one. It was not administered in follow-up two but was administered in follow-up three. So we are still waiting to see follow-up three uh, data and to be able to work with it. But uh, it's important to recognize you know, that, that uh, the data that I had to work with was only people who were, were 65 and over and uh, who they had to be physically and cognitively able to participate on their own and to communicate in English or French. So we don't have uh, um, a racially diverse sample in CLSA, but again, we have uh, numbers that uh, we have not seen before. Next slide, please. So the... Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on the elder abuse uh, module, it came was developed from de definitions uh, that were part of a pilot study by McDonald and Bolio, and that are reported uh, in the Canadian uh, uh, something called the Canadian National Survey on the mistreatment of older Canadians in, 19, uh, in 2015. I was actually part of that pilot study, one of the, uh, the co-investigators. And uh, the module includes four questions on psychological abuse, 
six on physical abuse and three on financial abuse. And in a minute, I'll show you those questions because it's really important to see you know, what was asked. And what we did in the uh, analysis was to dichotomize the uh, variables for each of the abuse types and overall as you know, that it was abuse or, or that they did experience abuse or they did not. Next slide. So this one shows you the psychological abuse questions. And uh, as you see, if the time period was the past 12 months and pe people were asked, did anybody criticize you, insult you, threaten or intimidate you or exclude or, or ignore you. And uh, people that have worked with this data have uh, decided that you know, all of us at some point in time are insulted by somebody. Um, so it had to be or criticized or sometimes ignored. So it was uh, various people, researchers have decided you only call it psychological abuse uh, if it in the past 12 months it occurred many times or every day. So just not a one-off, but that it's something that's more, more persistent. In the case of threats or intimidation, on the other hand, uh, any occurrence was considered positive. So, you know, if somebody threatened you or, or intimidated you, that's a more severe kind of uh, psychological abuse. Next slide, please. In terms of physical abuse, again, the, the time frame was 12 months. Uh, did somebody push, shove, or grab you? Did they throw something at you? Did they hit or slap you? Uh, they Did they choke you or threaten you with a weapon? I mean, these, I think all of us would agree, are quite serious and are uh, indicative of physical abuse. Next slide. And this shows you the financial abuse. Uh, did anybody make you give you, know, you give them your money, your possessions, or your property? Did they take your money, or did they prevent you from accessing your money, your possessions, or property? And that that uh, preventing from access is really quite interesting. Uh, recently, I heard of a case where there was an older gentleman who wanted to give some money from his uh, bank account uh, to a charity. And he was prevented from doing so by his wealth management manager who had worked with him for some 35 years. But every time he said, I want to give it, she'd say, well, not this week, maybe next week, and so on. Which, uh, when I was asked about it, I says, to me, that is financial abuse. So just to give you, you know, a couple of examples of, of uh, what really does go on. Next slide. So coming down to our findings, the uh, overall prevalence uh, in this sample was 10%. But what leaps out when we look by uh, gender and sexual orientation is that the, the largest number of victims were, were um, lesbian or bisexual women, and it's statistically significant difference. Um, next slide. When we look at the uh, individual types of abuse, we see the same pattern for psychological abuse. Again, significantly larger numbers of lesbian and bisexual women being victimized. Next slide. In the case of financial abuse, similar pattern. Next slide. But when we come to physical abuse, the pattern is different. And although the difference wasn't significantly, statistically significant, what shows on the slide is that uh, gay and bisexual men were more likely to be uh, physically abused than uh, the other three groups. Next slide. In terms of relationships, 
as we would expect uh, in the case of psychological abuse, people who were in a, uh, uh, were partnered or married were more likely to be uh, well abused by their partners. But what is quite interesting, uh, and as you see, the respondents could choose more than one option, was that in addition to the usual kinds of perpetrators that one would think about, uh, you know, siblings, child, grandchild, other family members, even a paid caregiver, there were a substantial number of people who said they were abused by somebody that was outside of those categories. And uh, th this is something we hadn't quite expected to find. And uh, I'll come back to that, but I think it, you know you want to notice that in the patterns of responses. Next, please. Uh, the, it's in terms of, of uh, spouse or partner, it's interesting that there are about equal proportions where the partner was male versus the partner being female. And it's, you know, the common myth is that um, abuse is basically a female issue. But work by uh, Lysova from the Crim Criminology Department at SFU indicates that uh, male spouse partner or partner victimization is much more common than people tend to think about. And if we look at the others who are, are the perpetrators, um, we see that it tends to be more males than um, females. So if somebody's going to to uh, one of in this other category, which includes people like your neighbors, your landlord, um, or or stranger, you know, in the classical definition of elder abuse, it's supposed to be uh, to deal with a situation where there is an expectation of trust. And it has tended to focus on uh, family members or people like paid caregivers or even friends. But with, with making a distinction between those kinds of relationships and where it's a stranger or someone in a business uh, setting. So uh, what we see is, is, is in this data set, people are telling us that it isn't only those kinds of relationships that we should be looking at, but also a little broader. So for real people on the ground who are victims, they tend to think about uh, not more than just family or, or uh, ongoing relationships, but to start to, to include in their perception of what is abuse, uh, people who are strangers. And that has tended to be, you know, in the past, uh, considered sort of a separate category of um, crime or victimization or criminal kinds of settings. Next slide. What we see is, as we would expect, uh, where the perpetrator is a spouse or partner, they tend to be someone that uh, is living with the victim. In the case of, of others, it's the other way around. It's more likely to be somebody who is living separately from the victim. Next slide. So in the case of, of uh, physical abuse, as we see again, the, the dominant and the largest category is spouse or partner. Uh, next slide. And again, we see you know a similar uh, proportion where it's it's the male partner uh, being the perpetrator as uh, in a situation with the female. And so you know we need to think about this in terms of uh, the LGBT community that many people don't think about two women living together who might. Um, be physically abusive, but it does happen. 
it isn't only that the perpetrator is always male versus female. Uh, it isn't always that the, the perpetrators are mainly in, uh, in uh, well, amongst gay men. It can also happen. And uh, in another project that I've worked on, uh, we have some scenarios which actually show uh, a situation where you know one of the uh, 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 members of a lesbian couple actually uh, socks her partner in a in a uh, uh, um, where they were arguing, and so it does happen. Next slide. And again, in the case of uh, physical abuse, they are more likely to live with the victim. And amongst the others, again, uh, to live elsewhere. And I've raised some interesting questions. You know, during the pandemic, uh, people were, were isolated. And uh, in some cases, there were, were uh, people who lived alone before, but whose child or other relative, somebody moved in with them, which would make them more likely to be a victim of physical abuse. So on the one hand, living alone is, is uh, uh, may make you more likely to be um, a victim of somebody who doesn't live with you, right, a stranger, but it's living alone in, in uh, is in fact a, a, a protective factor for uh, physical abuse. So you may be ripped off by a stranger, but you're not going to be ripped off by the person who you're living with. Next slide. So in the case of financial abuse, what leaps out of this slide is that it tends mostly, like the highest category is the other category. And when I, I look, looked at the data, because there is some that's you know right in, uh, or the person was asked who was the other person. Uh, a, a few of them actually, uh, uh, I had to giggle because they said, well, it was the, the IRA, the, or the CRA rather, the, uh, who ripped them off. And, you know, they were complaining about, you know, government and taxes and so on. So they, in, in the, again, real people on the ground are including some of those kinds of situations or a landlord who's preying on them in terms of, of, of rent. Next slide. So this shows uh, in the case of financial abuse, it's more likely if the um, spouse or partner is male. And in the case, uh, we see the same thing in the situation of other. If you're going to be ripped off financially, it's likely more likely to be by a male than a female. But still, we want to notice that there are some that are being ripped off by uh, females. Next slide. And this shows uh, the situation of, in the case of financial abuse, it's much more likely to be somebody who doesn't live with you. Next slide. Now, this, these are the uh, uh, really interesting ones where we start to look by the sexual orientation of the victim. And what we see here is that in cases of psychological abuse, the uh, perpetrator uh, is most likely in the case of heterosexual men to be their female partner. Uh, in the case of lesbian or bisexual women, the, uh, we see a different pattern. See, and in gay and uh, uh, bisexual men, it's other. So again, it, it, you know this this idea of it's not just your partner, 
or somebody in, in the kinds of standard uh, relationships that we've looked at, but rather that gay men are being ripped off by people by other people that are not their sibling or their partner. Uh, next one. And again, this you know we look at uh, th these kinds of data, uh, the the sex and uh, the looking at the sex of the perpetrator compared with the sex of the uh, victim. And we see that there are, are different patterns, somewhat different patterns for the uh, lesbian and bisexual women than we see, for example, amongst uh, heterosexual women. Next slide. And again, we looked at living arrangement. Um, and we see that that in the case of gay and bisexual men, they usually don't live with their victim or with their perpetrator. Victims don't live with their perpetrators. Uh, next slide. So we, what this, this shows you in these slides, and I'll very quickly, we'll move forward and give you a summary, um, is that there are, uh, we've looked at these and we see patterns so in the physical abuse, gay and bisexual men more likely to be uh, victimized by somebody outside of their relation, standard relationships. And it's also interesting, you know, very few are being uh, victimized physically or psychologically or financially by a paid caregiver. But there are a few. Next slide. Um, let's let's, let's uh, go forward for the next one. Okay, so the patterns are slightly different for the, the three types of abuse that we looked at in CLSA. Uh, next slide. And next one. Next one. Next one. Okay, so in, in, in summary, psychological abuse was the most common experienced by 8.8% of the sample, with the rates for physical and financial being substantially less. And this is a common finding that psychological, you know, regardless of whether you do the study in, in UK or in uh, Malta or in Vancouver, uh, you're going to find psychological abuse is the most common. Uh, sometimes the financial abuse comes out uh, more strongly than it did in this CLSA sample, um, but it's, it's less than psychological. Uh, what we also see in our data, and this is the first really to show this, this kind of a pattern, is that lesbian and bisexual women were more likely than people in the other three groups to experience psychological and financial abuse, whereas gay uh, or bisexual men were more likely to have to experience physical abuse. Next slide. And so this tells us, you know, the psychological uh, abuse most common um, with the, the uh, again, uh, when you look at those three different types, we see lesbian and bisexual more women more likely to experience psychological and financial, gay and bisexual men more likely to be uh, phys experience physical abuse. And in terms of perpetrators and the relationships, psychological and physical abuse, uh, the abuser most commonly was a spouse or partner, followed by a friend or child. And in financial abuse, it was most commonly that other category. Next slide. And psychological and physical abuse were most commonly perpetrated by somebody who lived with the victim. Financial abuse 
most common uh, with, with um, the perpetrator being a male who didn't live with the victim. And the patterns differed amongst the, uh, the Soji groups. And if we want to just go back um, in to, to take a look, or you may, may want to look uh, uh, yourself afterward at the slides or at the papers that we, we have written about, uh, where we've written about this study, and we have two that are in fact published, um, that, that when you look at who are the perpetrators for the lesbian and uh, uh, bisexual women, that it's sometimes more often than than not, uh, it's one of their own relatives, which is a little different pattern than than some of the uh, than the other groups, and and it tends to be it could be a brother that is one of those who uh, is financially or uh, uh, victimizing their their lesbian uh, or bisexual relative. So uh, next slide. So in terms of the way forward, like, you know, what does this tell us? What should we be doing? Next slide. We really do we need to recognize that the risk and protective factors are different for different living arrangements, as well as the somewhat different for the abuse types that we looked at, financial, uh, psychological, and physical. Uh, and they also are somewhat different depending on the, uh, the sochi of the victim. And so, you know, the safer at home slogan was used to promote staying at home uh, as a way of curbing the spread of COVID-19. But the potential for violence, whether it's it's oral violence, psychological kinds of violence, uh, spikes when people spend 24-7 uh, in the home with their abuser. And uh, in the case of the older adult, the abuser can be a spouse or same-sex or same partner, child, relative, hired, uh, a paid um, caregiver, or even a, a volunteer caregiver, uh, and living alone may be protective factor for physical abuse, but a risk factor for financial abuse, fraud, and scams. And one of the things that we're seeing much more of than uh, we expected is cybercrime. And so I've been very interested in watching and in, in looking at the data. And if you do so, what you see is that uh, seniors are being victimized on the internet or by telephone uh, in, in much greater numbers. Seniors tend to be more trusting and they're not as, uh, I mean, many seniors are tech savvy, but they may not be as vigilant as they need to be in looking at the uh, URL or the the any of the uh, the tag uh, lines and the identifiers of who's sending them the scam and I think all of us these days on our computer uh, are getting messages that look like they're real and you think it's the bank or you think it's this, the uh, the C the CRA or uh, you get one, that, and they're getting to be more sophisticated. So I, I think what we're going to see is a lot more frauds and scams uh, coming forward. And we need to make sure that our loved ones who are uh, in the, the um, over 65 category are... Uh, are given the information and educated and so that they don't fall victim. Next slide. So in terms of, of, of limitations of, of our research, 
uh, as I said, you know, it's the data collection on elder abuse is not performed, unfortunately, in every cycle. But uh, the good news is that uh, we are analyzing the data from the follow-up too, which is on intimate partner violence. And our analysis so far are showing a very similar pattern to elder abuse that intimate partner violence also, the rates are higher for uh, lesbian and bisexual women. Uh, another limitation is, you know, although uh, this is a, a relatively large sample of uh, people who identify as part of the LGBT uh, uh, community, we still have, you know, not too many of uh, uh, people or not as many people as as one would like in order to be able to do some really sophisticated kinds of of uh, analysis looking at the predictive variables and uh, the elder abuse only captures experiences over the past 12 months so we don't know much about the chronicity uh, we're trying to look at adverse childhood uh, events from some of the uh, of data that has been collected, uh, in particular when we're looking at intimate partner violence. Next slide. And uh, as I say, you know, we don't have a lot of information on the perpetrators. Uh, it would be nice to know um, something about the health status, the social support, uh, which we're, we're going to try to look at in additional studies that we do. And uh, like, as I said, the, you know, some of the respondents con con considered abuse by others don't meet the usual criterion. Um, and with the, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency as a perpetrator of financial abuse. Next slide. So this is my contact uh, information. And if you're interested in this topic, uh, I would suggest that you uh, consider reading the uh, two articles that were already published. And they are part of a special issue of OBM geriatrics that brings together uh, a group of, of eight papers. Uh, having to do with elder abuse. And some of those papers are from some qualitative work that we did where we actually uh, interviewed people who, older adults who had been uh, victims of abuse. So it, it's, it, it's a, a different way of looking at it. You know, on the one hand, we've got numbers from CLSA. The, uh, it's called the Indigo Study, which, um, it, you know, as you may know, uh, the, the, uh, most of the uh, advertising or, or promotion of World Elder Abuse Day uses purple as a symbol of elder abuse. And so that's why our project is, is called Indigo. And in that one, the, the nine people that we interviewed uh, there were four of them who were lesbian, there were two trans people, and there were some gay men. And uh, we, we, we get the flavor of what people experienced. And what comes out loud and clear from that line of research is that many of these people had experienced uh, homophobia or transphobia over at some point uh, in their life course and that that continues into to, uh, and to affect them when they get older. So, uh, you know, you can be a victim of elder abuse for the, and, and, and it's the first, your first experience of abuse when you're over 65, but some people have had uh, abuse situations from the time they were children or and or young adults and or middle-aged adults. 
And so that's a line of research that uh, people are conducting these days, trying to get a better handle on uh, the numbers. So is it that, uh, you know, which comes first? Is the chicken and egg kind of situation that not everybody who was a victim of child abuse becomes a victim of elder abuse. And uh, uh, not everyone who has uh, experienced abuse experiences it at the same point in the lifespan and, and over the course of your life. So you want to, to ask, you know, have you ever experienced is a different question than are you experiencing it now? And those uh, sort of the the sequela of uh, having ex been been uh, discriminated against through most of your life because you're, you're a, a member of the LGBT community uh, is that a that's a different kind of experience, and that people who are providing services need to be aware of this and need to ask questions and to be you know, trauma sensitive in working with older people. So uh, I could go, you know, talk talk about this for probably another two hours, but <laughs> I think my time is up. Uh, these are the, the standard acknowledgements that we make uh, and we're grateful uh, in this, for my particular research, I'm grateful uh, to CLSA uh, and the groups that have uh, the agencies that have funded them, but I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that funding for uh, this analysis and for other work that I'm doing uh, was provided by a grant from the uh, Council to Reduce Elder Abuse uh, located in the province of British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gutman. I think this is such an important and timely webinar um, for all of our researchers, participants. Um, so we will go to some questions now. We definitely do have several, um, and I'll read them out and you can comment on them. We have um, several to get through, so we'll we'll do our best. And uh, for those of you, if we don't answer your question, we will follow up with you after. So the first question, um, would financial abuse by a stranger be considered abuse? Um, and Jane Schlosser says, our jurisdiction would typically consider this a fraud or scam, which is outside the scope of elder abuse and not included in prevalence rates. So it, it is asking for the distinction between fraud and scam? I think so. It sounds like in one jurisdiction, elder abuse or financial abuse is considered um, fraud and scam and not included in prevalence rates. So just any comment on that? Yeah. Well, if, if you go back to the definitions, uh, it's often it's it's not included. It's it's considered, you know, frauds and scams are considered crimes. And it's a little different than somebody telling you that I'm going to take your money or uh, um, give me your money. You know, the classical questions that are asked about financial abuse. So the frauds and scams are things that come at you where somebody is is uh, it's, it's taking money that you have. For example, you give your money to to some, uh, what do you call it now? The pyramid scheme guys, right? So that's not somebody who... In, in you're in a trust relationship with in the classical sense, which is why it has, you know, we haven't asked questions about that. But in fact, we're seeing more and more people, you know, who are, are older people getting somebody phones them up and tells them that uh they can get a big return on their money, or they see it in, in the newspapers or they in an ad. Uh, Give me your money and I will uh, give you a much better deal. Well, I mean, the thing is that with those, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. And that's what you have to put in your head. So that's different than somebody threatening to out you if you don't give them your money. 
or your kid saying, you know, if you love me, you'll lend me. I think it's important to make that distinction. So thank you for that. Um, the next question is, I think I'll read half of it. Since the LGBTQ population has experienced past marginal past marginalization, trauma, and long-term discrimination, could that background have influenced or colored what was reported on by these respondents? Okay. I I can't see the questions. Are they are you putting those on? Um, these questions are in the um, Q and A uh, box down at the bottom of the screen. That's and then if it helps to also um, see them. Okay. What are we looking at? Um, we're looking at the question by Mark from Mark. And um, I started reading it halfway halfway down, so yep. I'll read it again. Uh, so since the LGB, LGB population has experienced past marginalization, trauma, or long-term discrimination, could that have influenced or colored what was reported on? Um, well, the, you remember that in this particular data set, right, there are very specific questions that define the different types. But uh, probably in the, in the sense that uh, what they're, you know, they're, they are reporting um, and, and it will be based on their experience of marginalization, trauma, and discrimination. Um, but these questions were quite specific so it's it's in that sort of other category where we're picking up when maybe come pick, picking up their uh, past experiences. Yeah, and speaking of that other category, there was um a, the next question is about that, and if you have any insight into what or who is actually in that category. Okay, well, things people like your health professionals or your financial advisor and so on, uh, they are known to the person. And uh, it's, it, it is a trust relationship in a sense, but it's, these are not people that, that in, in the past have been looked at. It's been more, you know, the concern has been more about, you know, who do you live with? Who are your relatives? So what this data suggests is that we should be looking uh, more widely at who the perpetrators might be and asking more questions in particular and uh, the extent to which the older person is um, trusting. And should those people you know, be, be, be looked at uh, in a different way. Okay. So we'll go on to the next question by uh, Horst, which is, to what extent are rates of abuse the result of lateral violence of, or abuse from same-aged peers? Older people are generally less accepting of variations in sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Is this abuse something we would expect to decrease over time as younger people age? Yeah, well, one hopes that in the future there will be less discrimination. I mean, certainly the generation of people who are uh, out, outed themselves uh, as part of the LGBT community um, it, that are older now ha will have experienced a very different kind of life than people who are uh, young and gay. So uh, we, we would hope that over time the, that discrimination would be reduced. But uh, look what's going on in south of the border. And in some countries, you know, it's still very much uh, considered a crime and, and a, a, a moral abjugation uh, if somebody is uh, identified with uh, one of the uh, LGBT groups. So yeah, the good news would be if if in fact there is less discrimination, but who knows? You know, if in situations such as as uh, uh, we're seeing, 
that these things don't go away. Um, in terms of the question, based, uh, is there a plan or a guideline development to identify the most appropriate approach to dealing with the different cases? The first thing is for service providers to think that maybe these people are being abused and to ask some questions, right? So to, to, to be sensitive to the possibilities that abuse could be occurring. And uh, once you do know that it's occurring, to try to provide some uh, mitigation strategies that will be acceptable to the person. Because in, you know, in, in abuse situations, the person has to be willing to uh, get to seek help. And so much of what, what we're doing uh, these days, particularly in the Indigo Project, is to try to bring together uh, people who may be victims or who may know victims with service providers uh, and to bridge the silos because those who work with the LGBT community may not necessarily work with the seniors community and vice versa. So a lot of their attention has been on younger people. And then, you know, in institutional settings, well, institutions will say we don't have any. Well, that's not true. If approximately 10% of the population identify as LGBT, then you're going to have 10% of any group population that will be LGBT, whether or not they have outed themselves. So I think we have one more question, hopefully, uh, which is, did strangers get excluded from the prevalence rates for elders? No, the, str the strangers are included in our prevalence rates. So the, the ones that are called other are included. Well, I think the timing is perfectly to, uh, perfect to, to close the webinar today. Um, so thank you again for the webinar and for being our presenter, Dr. Gutman. We really appreciate your participation. Um, I'd like to revi remind everyone who attended that the next deadline for data access applications is July 10th of 2024. Um, you can visit the CLSA website under data access to review what data is available, as well as other details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete the anonymous survey upon exiting the Zoom session today. Um, and that basically concludes today's webinar. Uh, we'll be presenting a new series of webinars um, come September, and details will be available soon on our website uh, to, to see what those topics will be. And again, your feedback on the webinars does help us uh, shape the both the topics and the delivery of them. And lastly, I'd like to remind everyone that the CLSA promotes the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. So we invite you to follow us on X or the former Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCZ. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the day.